Good morning. Welcome to worship from our old ship meeting house this morning, Sunday after Thanksgiving. It's good to see you all spread out on my screen. We begin as we do each week with a bell and then our prelude from Christopher Nicholson Mann, as always, and Anbantino by Frederick Schneider. And then our guest preacher for today, Bob McKechnie from First Parish in Cohasset will offer the call to worship, followed by Christopher singing our introit. Good morning. Bob, if you'd offer our call to worship. Thank you, that would be wonderful. I call us to worship with the words of Louise Robeck. We come to this hour knowing that it is but an hour. Yet out of all the hours in the week, this is the one that is set apart. An hour that is saved. An hour that is savored. It is a time for us to recognize what gives life meaning. It is a time to honor what we value. It is a time to celebrate our lives. Let us then celebrate, honor, and recognize that we might fully savor this hour we have saved. Amen. And Eva Marks, one of our deacons, will offer words for our chalice lighting, Eva. Good morning. Um, this is a prayer by Alden Solovi, who is a Jewish liturgist and poet. Spirit of compassion and help, justice and mercy, mercy, kindness and peace. Bless our leaders with dedication and foresight, fortitude and imagination to solve the complex issues that threaten our future. May they lead us to a time when neighbors embrace and communities thrive, a time when liberty and equality reign supreme. Source and shelter grant safety and security to all nations and communities so that truth and harmony will resound from the four corners of the earth. Let the light of wisdom shine brightly in the halls of power, a beacon of hope, for every land and every people. So I light this chalice as a beacon of hope. May it ever be so. Thank you, Eva.
Now we're invited to sing together, at least to watch each other sing. And the hymn is Here We Have Gathered. It's number 360. If you have a hymn book or, or if you downloaded the, the hymn, you can sing along. Here We Have Gathered, number 360. <laughs> Good morning again and welcome to worship from the Old Ship Meeting House. It's a delight to see all of you spread out on the screen in front of me. A delight to welcome you back to our worship. Uh, First Parish in Hingham, Unitarian Universalist, Old Ship Church. A special welcome this morning to Reverend Bob McKechnie. I mentioned at the outset, Bob will be our preacher this morning. He's preaching from First Parish in Cohasset, where actually I'm preaching right now this minute, having pre-recorded their service at First Parish a little while ago. So in the miracle of modern technology, in any case, it's a delight to welcome Bob back to Old Ship. This is our annual pulpit exchange between our two congregations, which has been going on for many decades, uh, no matter who has actually occupied the pulpits. Uh, serve the ministry in each of our congregations. So welcome, Bob, and thank you. Uh, my single announcement about upcoming events this week at Old Ship, we are resuming our custom, our practice of many years of Wednesday evening Vesper services between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So there will be four Wednesday evenings at 6.30. They too will be from the Old Ship Meeting House, the Zoom link, uh, will be in our newsletter and on the website this week. We're also invited, you are invited to pick up a candle, uh, a beeswax candle from a basket in front of the meeting house each Wednesday afternoon so that you too can light a candle when we come to our candle lighting time in the Vesper services. So that there will be enough candles to go around, we invite you to keep that candle for all four services or if you pick one up the second week, They'll be there as long as they last. So Vespers on Wednesdays at 6.30 in the evening. We'll open the Zoom a little bit before that. Here end the announcements. For our time for all ages, once again, Chloe Bride, our Director of Religious Education. Chloe. Good morning, everyone. It's so lovely to see everybody today, so. 
So I wanted to um, mention that this month was the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, this is typically a, um, a day or a time to mourn for trans folks who've died because of acts of violence against them. Um, you will see services in the community or in other places um, remembering those who've died. Um, but today we're not gonna talk about the Day of Remembrance in particular, but in that spirit, I do wanna share a story with you all um, that was authored by a trans man about a little boy who becomes a brother. Um, I think it's a really cute story and I really hope you enjoy it. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you here. Here we go. Present it. My technology is a little slow this morning, so give me a second. Oh, we're still loading. Aha, here we go. <laughs> so it's called When Aiden became a brother and it's by Kyle Lukoff um, and Kaylani Unita. So when Aiden, when Aiden was born, everybody, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name. His room looked like a girl's room and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. You can see his room there. But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt like his room belonged to someone else and he always ripped or stained his clothes accidentally on purpose. Everyone thought that there were other kinds of girls. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections. Lots of girls didn't even wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself, but it was even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust and they learned a lot about, from other families with transgender kids like him. Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out a lot of names until one stuck. They changed his bedroom into a place where he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then one day, mom and dad had something to tell him. I'm going to have a baby, mom announced. A baby, Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be a big brother? Of course, said dad, ruffling his hair. Aiden thought about being a big brother was an important job for a boy like him. He wanted to make sure this baby would feel understood right away. The baby needed clothes, so Aiden and his mom went shopping. There were so many choices. Would the baby like seahorses or penguins better? Are you having a boy or a girl, asked a lady. Aiden didn't like it when people asked if he was a boy or a girl, and he hoped the baby couldn't hear yet. He was glad when mom just smiled and said, I'm having a baby. The baby's room needed to be painted, so Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store. Dad chose a gallon of sky blue paint and Aiden added puffy cloud white. Are you excited for your new brother or sister? Asked the paint guy. I am excited to be a big brother, Aiden said. The paint guy looked confused. Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question and was glad he had his dad there. The big rollers were fun to paint with. This room feels just like being outside, Aiden exclaimed. He had always felt trapped in his bedroom before they fixed it, but his new sibling wouldn't have to feel that way. You're right, said dad. Let's make some shapes in the clouds. Every baby needed a name and, he, and Aiden got to choose his own. 
but he remembered that it had been hard for his parents to let go of the names they gave him. He looked for names that would fit his new person no matter what they grew up to be. And you could see names like moss, cloud, rain, leaf. There's even names like willow, sage, forest. I think he really likes nature names is my guess. Babies need someone to read to them. So Aiden practiced and they practiced and practiced. Dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers. Uh, maybe later, said Aiden. He decided that picking flowers for his mom was more important. Two weeks before the baby's due date, Aiden started to worry. Maybe he should have picked different clothes. The blue walls might be too bright. He wished he could ask the baby which name they liked best. Mom came to tuck him in. Everything okay, sweetie, she asked. Aiden put his hands over where he thought the baby's ears would be. Do you think the baby will be happy with everything, he whispered. I don't want them to feel like I did when I was little. But what if I get everything wrong? What if I don't know how to be a good big brother? Mom hugged him tight. When you were born, we didn't know you were going to be our son. We made some mistakes, but you helped us fix them. And you taught us how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. This baby is so lucky to have you, and so are we. The next morning, Aiden found the box of his old baby pictures. He looked so different back then. It hadn't been easy, but he liked the boy he was growing into. Everything was, sorry, everything wouldn't be perfect for this baby. Maybe he would have to fix mistakes he didn't even know he was making. And maybe that was okay. You could see him as a baby there. And so this is the baby party. It's a baby. Aiden knew how to love someone. And that was the most important part of being a brother. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a lovely end of your holiday weekend. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks for that beautiful story. Much, much appreciated. We come to our time of sharing joys, sorrows, and concerns. Two of you did uh, write to me in advance, and I will share what you've written with everyone. But at the same time, I invite you, as always, to enter into chat any joy or sorrow or concern so that others can see what you bring to this day of your joy, sorrow, whatever's in your heart. The two that have come to me, first from Pat Bianco, she writes, would you please light a candle for Diane Jordan, Diane Elliott, and Kate Adams, who worked like troopers, froze most of the time in the unheated garage, and stood for endless hours over glue pots while picking through endless supplies of plants, pine cones, and shells. These valiant women were the reason that wreaths were so successful. And in fact, our wreath sale was indeed very successful. They sold out as of yesterday. Uh, this is the one remaining right behind me, making uh, several thousand dollars for old ship, but most importantly, giving plenty of Christmas cheer and happiness. Second from Mary Thomas. Mary asked for a candle for the healing power of words. She mentions first words spoken at uh, Sue's and Dan's marriage ceremony just this Friday and words spoken on the soulful and biblical, as she put it, PBS TV production of The Pilgrims. And she says this, for Mary's sister Rose's sister-in-law, Veronica, whose husband, Cezanne, has died recently. And Mary shares that in speaking with Veronica in their native Albanian, Mary was touched and inspired by Veronica's heartfelt expression of thanks in the words of their shared language which felt like a blessing to Mary. This she continued in the shadow, not only of this uh, devastating loss, but with memories of the terror of the Nazis, which they'd grown up 
the Nazis who had murdered her mother and uncle, leaving Veronica and her six siblings orphans. Mary writes uh, that the poetry of the ancient Albanian ode tradition, so accessible to Veronica in their conversation and her graciousness, bridged trauma and gratitude. And so this candle burns for Veronica's courage and memory of Cezanne and for the healing power of words. And the remaining candles burn for those representing what you've entered into chat and all those unspoken, unwritten that we carry in our hearts this day. We enter our time of meditation, prayer, and silence. The prayer, and Bob, if you'd be sure to unmute yourself, perhaps you have already. The prayer will be offered in meditation by our guest, Bob McKechnie. Bob, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Let us enter into the spirit of prayer and meditation. Let us seek a few moments of solace where we can be in touch with the quiet within us. May we embrace the present moment, slowing our pace, our breathing, and celebrating each moment. May we feel connected in spirit, sharing the burden when one of us is suffering. May we be in touch with the quiet within us and know a peace which only comes from our unity. Let us now enter into the silence. Amen.
Many Christophers, <laughs> thank you, Christopher. Just beautiful, the gift of love. Two readings this morning that uh, Bob has chosen for us. The first will be shared by uh, Keely Jordan, and the second will be shared by Bob. And so, Keely, please. Our first reading is Overwhelmed by Being by Reverend Richard Gilbert. There are times when we feel overwhelmed by being. We are on a treadmill walking hurriedly, going nowhere. The images of our lives fly past us on a movie screen. The hands of the clock we see actually moving too quickly. At such times, we need to gather ourselves together, slacken our pace, black out the screen, ignore the clock. Then we can remind ourselves that we are in charge of our lives that it is we who dictate our pace. We who choose to stop the rapidly moving screen. That we can set the rhythm of our own lives. It will not be easy. It is never easy to confront ourselves, to turn ourselves around, to get some kind of handle on the story of our own lives, to realize that we are the architects of our own fate. To be sure, there are powers and principles that confront us, that demand our time and energy, are endless. We cannot confront our environment. We are, after all, finite and flawed creatures. But out of that finitude comes a yearning for meaning. Out of the flawed nature of our being, we yearn for purpose. Out of the hectic rush of events, we can still set our own pace. We are the only ones who can. Here ends the reading. Our second reading this morning is Stopping by Woods by Robert Frost. I don't want you to so much focus on the words, but the feeling, the emotions that come from these words. So think of this as a meditation. Relax, maybe close your eyes. And let these words flow over you. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and the frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound for the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep. 
and miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. Beautiful, Bob. You've given new life, fresh life to words we've heard so many times. We come to our time of offering. We cannot pass the plate here in the meeting house, but we can still make our gifts. We can go onto the Old Ship website and find the donate button and make a gift to our general ministries, our plate offering, as we call it. And at the same time, or at the same time, whenever you're able, to make a gift to this month's outreach offering. We heard very movingly from Herb Newell last week about the work of the Friends of the Homeless of the South Shore. And this is the final Sunday of this outreach offering. So we invite your generosity as much as is possible for you. Thank you. Our offertory anthem, Le Sommeil de l'Enfant by Teresa Carignol. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but Christopher, thank you. Christopher, and it is, uh, and thank you for your gifts, whenever you give them, however much you're able to give. It's a real pleasure to introduce Bob. Um, Bob's been at First Parish Cohasset for I think about five years. And as some of you know, Cohasset congregation has been through some difficult times over the years. And Bob has been a real blessing to that congregation, the ministry that he's brought, the care and kindness that he's brought. Uh, that's important. Con Cohasset is a sister or brother, a sibling congregation of ours. It actually, folks in Cohasset decided they needed their own church. They started out with us uh, many, many years ago. So we, uh, they va we value them and we're very pleased to have Bob with us this morning. So Bob, for your sermon. Thank you for your kind words. And thank you to all of you for inviting me back for my fifth consecutive year. The title of my serving sermon is Living Life in Real Time. One day last year, I was on an elevator. I trust you remember what those are. I was on an elevator in the lobby of a building in downtown Boston. 
And in a single motion, I entered the elevator, pushed the number seven so that I could be sure that the elevator would stop at the floor where I intended to disembark. And after pushing the button, I proceeded to step further in and turn around facing the door, just like most people would do. And as I did so, I caught the eye of the only other person on the elevator, a man who was standing close to the elevator buttons. He glanced at his watch and sighed as a look of slight disgust crossed his face. I, I didn't take it personally. I just figured he must be late for something. From inside the elevator, we could see a woman crossing the lobby and approaching the elevator. As fast as he could, the man reached for the panel of buttons. And you know, I'm still quite naive. I really expected that the man was going to hold the door open button so the woman could get on the elevator. But no, instead the man started frantically and repeatedly pressing the door close button. And as the door started to close, the very apparently experienced woman elevator rider picked up her speed. She made a leap for the elevator. She waved her umbrella in front of the electric eye and successfully got the elevator door to retract and greeted us both with a hearty good morning as she came barreling aboard. All this without spilling one drop of the lidless coffee she was carrying in the other hand. I was startled at first. It took my brain a moment to register that it wasn't the woman's intention to impale me with the umbrella as she, just, as she charged toward the elevator like a jouster from an earlier centuries tournament. But it did occur to me that the skill it took this woman to get on the elevator in spite of the man's intention to get that door shut was nothing short of an Olympic feat. Before reaching the seventh floor, both people left the elevator. I was left alone, wondering about both of their lives. Why in the world was that man so intent on closing the elevator door? And how in the world did that woman develop the skill of balancing hot coffee while traveling at such a great speed? I think they both, at least that morning, had the same problem. They were in a hurry. Though most of them today are mask wearing, we all encounter hurrying people in our everyday routines. Perhaps you have witnessed somebody compulsively pressing a crosswalk button. Maybe as you are traveling up the highway, somebody enters from the ramp on your right at a high speed, ignoring the yield sign that they were subject to. They of course pull right in front of you, forcing to slam on your brake or swerve into another lane to avoid a collision. Maybe you've witnessed the occasional person slipping through the 10 items or less counter at the supermarket with many more than 10 items. Maybe you've even tried that yourself, or perhaps you have felt your blood pressure rise while waiting for the person in front of you at the ATM machine to get out of your way. Nobody expresses the absurdity of rushing for the sake of rushing like Woody Allen. As he does in his 1996 screenplay, Everyone Says I Love You. He wrote, quote, I'm going to kill myself. I should go to Paris and jump off the Eiffel Tower. And then I'll be dead. And you know, in fact, if I get the Concord, I could be dead three hours earlier, which would be perfect. Oh, well, wait a minute, he says. It, with the time change, I could be alive for six hours in New York, but dead for three hours in Paris. I could get things done and I could also be dead." End quote. Once I got thinking about the speed at which people live their lives, I started noticing signs of hurrying everywhere. One minute I see a Coca-Cola slogan for its high caffeine soft drink called Surge. It reads, feed the rush. The telephone company will gladly charge you to push a single button after you've called directory assistance if you don't want to waste three seconds dialing the number yourself. And now you, can watch a, you can't watch a sports program or even the news without being asked to jump up, run to your computer and log in with your opinion in real time about whether the runner was safe or out at first base. 
or whether or not you think we should bomb Iran without the support of the UN. Yes, that's what we need, more people determining the fate of an entire country without a moment's reflection. It seems that our culture is increasingly dictating that we be doing something with each and every moment. No downtime. Even dinner time is routinely interrupted with computer generated solicitations. It is no wonder that even in this time of forced isolation, we are all still particularly anxious. So many are fretting about what they cannot do. James Glick, author of the book, Faster, the Acceleration of Just About Everything, says that most of this hurrying comes about, came about when the railroad was invented. Speed, he says, first came with trains. The railroad bewildered passages by causing familiar features of the landscape to float across their field of view at a high speed. It did not take much speed to create amazing, strange sensations. Think for a moment what it would have been like for you to get on the train for the very first time, having never been in a moving vehicle before. We flew on the wings of the wind at the varied speed of 15 to 20 miles an hour. A first time passenger wrote in 1830, we annihilated time and space. But with trains came the necessity to regulate time. Railroads demanded punctuality. The telegraph gave the railroad the ability to synchronize time across the wide expanse of the country. The country was networked in a way. Time was as a, uni as a universal was ticking away everywhere in unison. And that seemed normal to us, but to the 19th century railroad time came as a shock. Charles Dudley Warner in Harper's New Monthly Magazine in 1884 wrote, quote, the chopping up of time into rigid periods is an invasion of freedom and makes no allowances for differences in temperament and feeling, end quote. But Henry David Thoreau liked what railroad time was doing to the country. He wrote, quote, have not people improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Do they not talk and think somewhat faster in the depot than they did in the stagecoach office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere now, end quote. Well, obviously trains and telegraphs did speed things up a bit. And since that time, we have seen transportation and communication systems evolve. But with our inventions and time-saving gimmicks come costs that are not very easily measured. What was the benefit to Frost's character in his poem that we read earlier? For stopping and watching the woods fill up with snow when he rode his horse rather than take the train. He, like all of us, had promises to keep and miles to go, but still he stopped. Would you have? What is the benefit of Richard Gilbert's reminder that we slacken our pace blank out the screen, ignore the clock. Today, we are still inventing things. For most people, such time savers as computers, smartphones, overnight delivery, voicemail, online services, or high-speed modems actually create more time stress than they eliminate. We may save time by making a 10-minute call on the cell phone instead of talking on the home phone after dinner, but then after dinner, we go on Facebook, losing the time we worked so hard to save. Instead of accomplishing the same goals more quickly, we set higher goals, constantly pushing ourselves to do more and do it faster, thus getting further and further behind. Unfortunately, the problem reaches far deeper than the misuse of time-saving gadgets. The feeling of being rushed saturates our entire way of life we measure our success in life by our level of efficiency and our ability to stay on top of it all. We measure the health of our economy in terms of increasing productivity. Many of us unconsciously are indoctrinating our children into our squeeze it all in mentality. 
And besides learning how to read and write, very young children are involved in tennis and swimming, music, gymnastics, ballet, soccer, often at the same time, back to back, hour to hour. This is a good time for us to reflect on those things before we all get our vaccine and start up again. We need to slow down to the speed of life. When we slow down, our perception of the world will change. It will become healthier and easier. We will work more intelligently and wisely. We will realize that much of what we previously thought was essential is actually unnecessary and can be postponed, delegated, or even disregarded. Living at the speed of life helps us set priorities in our lives in a more effective and joyful way. Instead of waiting to enjoy our lives when everything is finally done, which it never is, we can learn to enjoy the journey rather than merely looking forward to the final destination. Well, how might this be possible, you ask? I'll save you the time of reading many books about this because they are out there. Society today is forcing us into doing more and more analytical thinking and it is negatively affecting the quality of our lives without our realizing it. Yes, it's helpful to be analytical, especially when it comes down to figuring out how to take advantage of many high tech features on a newfangled wristwatch or smartphone. But we are in such a habit of thinking analytically that we now apply analytical thinking to problems that require a much slower, more reflective process. And we don't know how to do it, or we have gotten out of the habit. Because we rely so heavily on our analytical thinking, we often roll up our sleeves and get to work, speeding up, when we would be better served by slowing down or backing off or reflecting. We try to force answers instead of allowing them to unfold. And we try to think our way to solutions that would come easily to a quiet, receptive mind. As a result, we end up rushing around confused, frustrated, and frantic, nearly spearing people with our umbrellas as we leap aboard elevators with closing doors or compulsively hitting the closed door button to our hearts. This speeded up way of living is reinforced by the hurried, frenetic pace of our modern technological culture. And because everyone around us is also living in a hurried state of mind, we mindlessly accept a frantic pace as inevitable. But it's not. Imagine deliberately sitting on the lobby sofa and actually tasting some of the coffee you're carrying while you're waiting for the next elevator. Someone once said, speed is the form of ecstasy that the technical revolution has bestowed upon humankind. We like the conveniences that technology provides us. I love the use of ways to get directions, but it seems we have become addicted to the speed of the technological revolution that is continuously evolving. I can't tell you how many people I know that are outright addicted to Facebook. Like all creatures, we adapt to our environment. We have become a more analytically thinking society. And now we are left with the challenge of relearning the skill of knowing when to switch back to reflective mode when our hearts need consulting. Learning to gain access to this quiet mode of thinking involves recognizing how important and practical it is. This is particularly true when we need answers to heartfelt issues, when we are confronted with a difficult moment, when we need to be at our best, or when we want to slow down our overactive mind or the pace of our life. Think for a moment of how you feel when someone answers their cell phone when you are in the middle of a conversation with them. Many thoughts or words may enter your head, but primarily you're probably disappointed that technology could enter and disrupt such a sacred place as your conversation. 
And I ask you to recognize that your homes are just as sacred. The importance of your relationships with coworkers and family are just as sacred. And many hours of time once spent reading a book or playing a board game are now spent alone surfing the net, buying stuff on Amazon, learning the next iteration of programming the television or reacting to your Facebook feed. Sure, we can get around the world at the click of a mouse, but we can never get back the time we spend doing it. I say, keep the technological toys, just turn them off once in a while. So may it be. Thank you, Bob. Reminders that could not be more important for our spiritual health and well being. So I will take my time extinguishing these candles, knowing that the love with which they were lit, the care, the concern in our hearts with which they were lit, these all endure, though the candles have been extinguished. Likewise, the values embraced, embedded in the flame of our chalice. This too endures wherever we go because we carry those values with us. to sing once more in the spirit of today's service and Bob's message, find a stillness. Number 352, if you have a hymn book in front of you, find a stillness. As we go forth from this time, may we find the spirit, the stillness by slowing down, slowing down to savor each moment, each day, each person before us. Among the many blessings of our lives, no matter what else life has given to us, has sent our way, knowing those blessings, may we turn and make of our lives a blessing to all life. Amen. Blessed be, so may it be, because we make it so. Our benediction and our postlude from Christopher.
Okay.